Welcome to the Dev Ready Podcast, where we're helping non-techs build better products. Uh, today, we interviewed Nick Costa. Nick Costa is from BrainMates. Uh, the whole concept behind his podcast is how do we validate an idea and how do we validate if we're actually solving the right problem for our customers. Now, Nick takes us into a deep dive on how we can basically explore those two things. One, um, are we solving the right problem? And then two, are we delivering the right solution that our customers are actually going to value and pay for? Uh, enjoy the podcast. Nick takes a, a deep dive on what he does to help product owners deliver better products within organizations. But we can pair that right back to anything really. Uh, in the end, if you have an idea or a concept, you really are potentially living in solution land. Um, Nick talks about how we get back into problem land, um, look at the key problems, what we're trying to solve, understand that, and then frame that out to what the best possible solution is to solve that problem. Enjoy the podcast. Tell us a bit about yourself and um, your background um, and all about BrainMates. Well, I'm Nick Costa from BrainMates. I'm one of the co-founders. Uh, BrainMates is a product management training and consulting business that's been uh, running since 2004. Um, we work with all different types of industries and organisations from basically in Australia and in the, in the general uh, uh, region. Um, uh, for anything from media to medical devices to government to education, we've worked with different sort of product roles um, across the board there. Uh, as part of what we do with BrainMates, our kind of our mission statement is to advance product management here in Australia. Okay. And so we've been sort of pushing that uh, that activity since 2000 and, uh, 2004. So from a product product management perspective, what does that mean to you? So who would your potential, who would you mostly be working with? Um, it can really be any type of organisation, but generally speaking, we, from the from the get-go, we've seen organisations that usually have at least 100 people in them. Okay. There's usually a product manager lurking in there somewhere mm -hmm. um, who is responsible for the product that that organisation is, is pushing. Yep. But if you kind of broaden out what product management is, mm -hmm. essentially any business, whether you're a sole trader or, or a huge corporation, you're solving a problem for a customer. And that solution to the customer is usually the product that they're selling in one form or another. Mm. So that's really where we sit. Okay. Um, we, we don't overlap much with the kind of the management consultants that focus on how to run the business. Mm -hmm. We focus at the kind of the pointy end of the story, which is how to run the product that the whole business revolves around. Okay. Are those product managers normally dedicated product managers or are those just part of their role within the organization? It can really vary. And I think this is part of the maturation of the role of a product manager that we've seen um, in some cases, the product management function is dispersed across different parts of the organization until there's a realization that either there are silos or things are breaking down or communication isn't working um, and they want a single focus point to, to, to really bring that product to life and make sure the communication works more effectively. Okay. In, since around about 2006, really with the, the birth of, of Facebook, social media, the two-way web, we've seen a shift in what product management means from being essentially, here's your product, don't break it, look after it, report every six months, mm -hmm. to being one of the core roles in the business. Because once you can tweet about how good or bad a product is, um, you can't now outmarket the the communication of customers. So you can't fake a bad product anymore. It's given um, customers or consumers basically a, a sounding board where they can actually put out their, their what they feel about a product and we never really had that. So it's changed the game completely. So yeah, when you look at product, but that's for the betterment of the, the consumer really. Um, if people or customer or companies are delivering better products, um, they're going to keep their consumers or their customers happy. Um, if they're not, they're not going to go out of business. So basically that's the world we live in today. Totally. And if you, if you roll back the clock, what we used to see was the biggest brands in the world mm -hmm. would, would be out marketing. So you could yes. Coca-Cola, your American Expresses, your cigarette brands, mm -hmm. they were massive. Mm. Um, but now you see them in decline, you see product brands um, have really taken the ascension in the, in the marketplace. Yeah, you no longer just can buy people or customers these days. Ads are just not the way to do it. Or you still need to be advertising, but your product needs to sell yep. itself. What do you mean by product brand? 
Well, if you see, I mean, we, we're all familiar, obviously, with how, how popular Apple has become. Mm-hmm. Um, Apple was a popular brand, but they never really sold themselves as the brand. They were good at branding. Mm-hmm. But the, the way they came to dominance was by delivering products that customers loved, mm-hmm. um, by, having, by solving problems in the marketplace that no one else was solving, and then doing it better than anyone else in the marketplace. Okay. And so organizations like the, you know, the huge Googles, Amazons, and Apple haven't done any real marketing per se relative to the brand companies around like, you know, your Coca-Cola's and what have you. Um, they've just solved problems that no one else is doing as effectively. I mean, I remember when someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, you should try this Google thing out. It's pretty cool. <laughs> and I thought myself a bit of an Alta Vista search engine, you know, building search ninja. Mm-hmm. And I tried Google. There was no clutter on the page. It was simple. And it just found stuff really easily. Mm-hmm. It was yeah. the best search engine and it's continued to evolve that way. Yeah, it just um, sold itself basically when people started using it. That's what it was. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, that's, and that's what great products do. Yep. Great products pull customers in rather than having a marketing team trying to pull customers in. If you're solving the the right problem for the customer, they it will pull. So that's the massive advantage for the business moving forward. So yeah. now your app brainmates have got a nice little framework that you work in. I'll just explain a little bit about that framework and what that means around. You've got the ID8, the design, the implementation, and just yeah. just a quick summation about that, and then we'll dive a little bit in probably into the ideation components. Sure. I think one of the one of the challenges a lot of people in product and many organisations have is they don't have a consistent way of attacking um, the flow from an idea through to a sort of a business case or a business justification, or and then through onto a project. Mm-hmm. Often organisations kind of start with a project to make something, and that's yes. where the kind of the formalisation of it begins. So the the brainmate sort of product management framework um, brings together a lot of the often fairly fuzzy activities at the start. So we step into ideation, which is kind of a a formalization of of people coming together with a spark of an idea. It's super lightweight. Okay. Um, We then step through what we call our innovation phase from there, which is to say, do we think this idea has any legs in the marketplace? Could it represent an opportunity for our business? That's more the business case building component, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So we want to make sure, or actually, it's actually just half of the business case. Okay. So a big chunk of an idea we don't know at that early stage, which is how are we going to build this thing? Mm-hmm. Um, and too often, we, when we talk about ideas, and we'll come back to this, I'm sure, a little bit later on, um, when we, people talk about ideas, they almost always talk about a solution to something. Yes. But we want to make sure that there's actually an underlying problem that those solutions solve. And as we go through our innovate phase, we'll often throw away the original solution concept because it was kind of a, just a, a brain bubble uh, okay. to begin with. But often that can lead you in interesting ways that allows you to find other alternative or even better, cheaper, faster solutions once we open up our, um, our, our, our imaginations to different possibilities. Do you generally find when you walk into an organisation or work with somebody that those solutions that they come up with are pretty quick solutions that they've, they've found within an organisation might be the first thing that came to mind and then they're all of a sudden exploring this. How do you find when you go into an organisation, what sort of level of detail have they put around the solution that they start talking about? The, the ideas often can come from anywhere. They can come from a, a salesperson who said, hey, you really need this thing that goes ding because otherwise we can't sell the product. <laughs> Yeah. It can come back from a CEO who's just come back from a conference full of full of you know great new possibilities that'll change the roadmap forever. Okay. Um, yeah. Come back from a support call yeah. uh, because this problem keeps coming up. So the, mm. the types of things can come up from anywhere. Mm. And often the the first thing to do is say, "Hey, make this." Yes. And often making that makes absolutely no sense in the business, mm. or the rationale for why it makes sense in the business hasn't been stated. Okay. Mm-hmm. Get it. And so the. Um, the, there might it might be a fantastic idea, mm. but often what we find is that the 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 problem that it's trying to solve may already be solved by the existing product. So you end up with feature creep or um, or you know you're overbuilding the product with new things that might actually be solved in the current solution, but it simply hasn't been surfaced by the marketing team or the product team because they haven't focused on what problem we're actually trying to solve. So it becomes more of an education thing at that point. Correct. And, and if you open yourselves up to multiple um, solution possibilities, mm-hmm. you also start to think, well, if, it's, if we could solve this through, through technology, that's one solve, 
but can we also solve this through customer support or education or different type of marketing or is there another way of attacking the same problem? Yeah, so you're really I, unshackling yourself to different possibilities. Yeah, because I think we can, in this day and age, we can also just jump into, let's jump into a technology solution and use technology for everything. Um, and sometimes yep. you don't really need it. And sometimes you don't really want it either. Um, it's not always the best case for a business to replace everything with technology because there still needs to be that human interaction. People want that. They need that. There still needs to be components of it. Otherwise, you're just going to be a technology business delivering technology and you lose that human interaction and experience. So there's something that that's, I find when I'm dealing with companies, you still need that and you can't just deal with a computer all the time. I don't find that being a great experience from my perspective. Yep. So in, ter- in terms of, um, so once you've gone through that innovation phase, what's next? So next we move into what we call our design phase, which is going deeper, firstly, into the customer problem. Mm-hmm. Because often when you write a business case, you shouldn't be designing the product yet. Okay. So you don't really know all of the details. Mm. And often, you know, the, the, the kind of the, the, the devil's in the detail, you'll find lots of things that you didn't anticipate. Yes. And just a, sort of a, probably a, a well-known example, um, if we look at Uber just as a, as a quick example, there's not many people who would necessarily have said before Uber came out, boy, I really love getting a cab. <laughs> the experience yeah. of getting a cab is just awesome. Um, so there was an opportunity to try and find something better than a taxi experience. Mm-hmm. But you didn't necessarily know what those benefits would be or what those differences would be until you go a level deeper. Get it. And then when you go that next level deeper in what we call our immersed stage, um, you start finding things out like, well, how long are you prepared to wait before you know there's a cab coming or a car coming? How, you know, what's the, what's the payment experience look like? How safe do you feel? these sort of more detailed, more nuanced um, uh, types of problems start to expose themselves. And you can start to prioritize which are the most important ones and which are the ones that can wait for later on. Okay. And so they still fall under the banner of the original sort of, in, in that particular case, the, the big idea. Mm-hmm. But now you need to work out, well, which, which more granular problem are we solving and what could be the potential solve for it? Okay. And obviously... When you create something new, you obviously create or an idea, you create more problems. So you're going to be finding more challenges and problems throughout that you need to solve as well. So generally, I, would you find that you're solving more than one problem throughout the scenario or is it just one key pivotal problem that you are solving and then everything else sort of comes together? Well, it, it, it comes back to, uh, in, as part of the ideation process, what your scope has been. Mm-hmm. So if you're trying to come up with a brand new innovation, blank slate, you're a kind of a startup mode, then the world's your oyster. You can come up with anything. Anything goes. But the usual sort of bigger ideas because you're trying to build a whole business around it. Yes, get it. If you have an existing product, mm-hmm. then you're probably reflecting on where is the product in its life cycle. Yes. Are we, you know, fighting against competitors? Are we trying to get an edge in the marketplace? Um, are we responding to customer complaints or issues that we're trying to solve? Are we trying to create the next sort of the 2.0 version of the product? So the so the context of that inquiry will be different from, from the sort of product team. Yeah, it depends on, yeah, so if, and if you've got a, a full product, you might be just focusing on one core feature or you might be rebuilding it, like you said, it's so a 2.0 component. Oh, so that's your designy sort of component. So you have to immerse and you've got define. What's the dif- defining, defining the features, what's being built? What does that look like? Well, then, one, one, so as you come out of the sort of the first stage of our yeah. design phase, Yes where we've tried to articulate the problem in more detail, mm-hmm. now we get to have fun with the solution. Okay. So any anyone who's in sort of service design or design mm-hmm. thinking modes would think of this as the double diamond approach anyway. Yep. So the first, first diamond is your problem thinking, the second diamond is your solution thinking. Okay. So this maps to uh, to you know other other popular design methods as well. So the define the stage is, is to try and define what the solution could be before you get down and actually start building it. Now, for those listening out there, can you dive in a little bit more on what the double diamond approach is? Can you explain it? For sure. Me? Yeah. Um, the, 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 the design thinking double diamond approach starts off with a problem definition, mm-hmm. and it usually starts off with divergent thinking. Okay. So the, the first triangle of the, of the first diamond is two diverging lines mm-hmm. where you're exploring the solution space. Uh, sorry, you're exploring the problem space. 
Mm -hmm. um, as you start to refine, and this kind of goes to our idea validation conversation, mm. as you start to work out which are the ideas or the, the problems that are most valuable to solve or have yes. the most customers who have them, or ideally the most painful problems to the most customers, mm -hmm. you start to refine your focus onto those, uh, those, that smaller set of problems until you've agreed on this is the specific problem or smaller set of problems that we're going to spend our attention on. Okay. So, yeah, so you then have convergent thinking converging on those two things. Mm -hmm. So the, the lines converge down into a second triangle, mm -hmm. which makes up your first diamond. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. The, um, then when we move into the solution diamond, um, we're again in divergent thinking. We're thinking, okay, for this smaller set of problems, how the hell are we going to solve them? Mm. Is it a technology fix? Is it a communication fix? Is it a business model fix? Um, of the different solution choices that we have, how are we going to attack it? And so the in in the in the brainmate framework, that's how what we use is our define stage. We start to look at different solution possibilities and uh, sort of play them off against each other as quickly as possible, um, so that we can land on one that the the essentially the solution team and the product team agree is uh, will solve the customer problem and is deliverable within a reasonable time frame. Yeah, well explained, Nick, is a good understanding of what it actually is. So starting out with a whole list of problems, defining in, or honing in on what you're actually going to solve, plugging yep. that into what are the possibilities for solutions, and then honing out into what the actual solution is based on what the best yep. scenario is for the business, for yep. the customers, and for the consumers. I think there might be a few yep. people out there that aren't aware of what design thinking might be. Yes, oh, there's plenty yeah, out there. That's a good ex explanation <laughs> for that. Yeah, no, very, very good. So cool. now, now we're through some sort of design, then you've got the implementation phase. So you, you, how, how do you approach that and what do you do in that aspect of it? Well, this is where most businesses yeah. um, generally excel at. Mm -hmm. the, the challenge is not how do I make a thing, but how do I make the right thing? Mm -hmm. Yes. The actual making part is usually pretty well developed in most organisations. Yes. So once we have defined mm -hmm. what, what solution we're going to deliver, then that's usually where you'd rev up a project team um, or a delivery team to actually start implementing or to continue implementing mm -hmm. um, the solution to the marketplace. That makes sense. In so in parallel with that, we would then start to prepare marketing communication or communications to the market to go out. And our final stage in that implementation is the launch planning activity. Make sure that we are prepared and ready to launch that, uh, that activity in the marketplace to make the maximum impact to the market and lift the business as much as possible. That sounds good. That gives us a great explanation of what your approach is in terms of innovation, design, and implementation, and all little facets in between. So, yep. now therefore, today we want to hone in a little bit more around the ideation and the validation component of that, because I think yep. um, a lot of organisations, and we've been a part of them in from a delivery perspective, helping organisations deliver on products that don't go nowhere, um, and they find that they put them out into the marketplace. Um, and they sort of struggle off. So ha what has the challenges been? Generally, we find they haven't validated. They never really engaged their customers to begin with, and they're probably solving the wrong problems. So um, probably gives you a bit of an understanding of why we're putting this podcast together. Um, and we, in the same realisation, is what the journey that we've been on is delivery is one thing, but delivering the wrong thing, doesn't matter how good it's delivered, it doesn't really make any impact. So how do we make better impacts? we step in at the front end and make sure that they're delivering the right product first. So from a validation, someone comes to an idea, where do they start from a validating perspective? Well, I think the, um, the when we talk to organisations, usually the problem they don't have is that they, you know, that a lack of, is a lack of ideas. Okay. So, so more often than not, they have lists and lists of ideas. There's ideas oozing out of their pores every day and um, they just don't know where to start. And so the very first step that we would take with an organization who has lots of ideas is to kind of take a deep breath and say, okay, let's declare a moment of the day or a half day or even up to a day as an ideation session to start to corral and bring those ideas together. So it could be that you're just pulling ideas that people have already had, okay. or you're actually sort of brainstorming and triggering new ideas. You can tread either way you like. Mm -hmm. But the output is you start to refine uh, some ideas down from essentially a post-it note of, of a concept mm -hmm. into an ordered list or rather a ranked list of the ideas you're going to start working through. In terms of ranking ideas, where would you start from a ranking perspective? What 
um, metrics would someone use potentially to rank an idea from? This is a great one too. This is something we might leave to later. Well, there's, there's actually one step before we rank them mm -hmm. that we would go through, which is to to make sure we have the right information. That we're actually ranking them on the right kind of uh, thing. Get it. Yeah, get it. So, so often if you look through someone's sort of backlog of ideas, um, what you'll see is a bunch of feature requests or ideas or things to do. They're tasks yes. or they're solutions. Mm -hmm. And they're fantastic. There's, there's usually some really good intent behind them. But the first thing to do is to kind of tip pause and ask why it, why should this idea even exist? Okay. And we, and we use a, a little tool, really simple little template, um, which we call our idea pad. Okay. And the way this works, it's a, it's a circular um, uh, template. Yep. In fact, if, if people who are listening go to brainmates.com.au slash idea dash pad um I'll they will now. be able to download a copy of this yep. and see it for themselves and so the the idea pad essentially has five or four quadrants and one circle in the middle in the circle in the middle you put your idea just as a, a placeholder um, and then each quadrant asks a question the first question is who's the customer who'll benefit from this idea and that could be an internal customer if it's a business opportunity. Mm -hmm. It could be an external customer. And the more specific you can be about that that uh, that answer, the higher fidelity the, the outcome will be. Okay. okay. So instead of saying we're targeting small business, you might say we're targeting um, small businesses that have 20 to 50 staff. And in particular, we're focusing on the account manager or the sales team. So it changes the nature of the conversation. So we want to focus on who is the actual person or the business role that that would be benefiting. The, the second um, question is for that particular target market or customer group, what problem are we solving for them? And this is probably the hardest question to answer because people immediately jump to, well, we're trying to make things better, faster and easier for them, <laughs> which isn't a problem. No, it's not a problem at all. <laughs> That's a benefit. Exactly. So that'll be the benefit. Mm. What we really want to get down is to actually asking the uncomfortable question, what really is the problem? And this is where a lot of ideas simply evaporate. You think something is a cool idea and you go, mm. well, actually, that problem isn't very strong or it isn't really a big enough problem to care about. Okay. People won't exchange money for it. Mm. So let's pack that one up right away. Get it. So problem first. So that's one of the biggest questions then to answer clearly. Are you yep. solving a big enough problem to make an impact? So at this stage, in the very early ideation, you're literally making this stuff up. Yes. If you have, if you have customer data that you've already yeah. drawn out, uh -huh. that's brilliant. Okay. But in the worst case, you're what we're calling the um, the MSU protocol, which is making shit up <laughs> protocol, um, where we are making up ideas because that's essentially where the idea came from anyway. Yeah, it all starts so, from you know, something. You're, you're putting together your very earliest hypothesis for what this could be. Okay. Um, the the third question is what benefit will that customer or that target market get if we can solve the problem? Uh -huh. okay. We don't know if we can yet, but what if we could? Mm. And then the final question is from a business perspective, if we solve this problem for this customer and deliver that benefit, then what's in it for us? Okay, so we're oh, making that quest, we're asking the question as early as possible. Mm -hmm. Do we think this will improve improve customer tenure? Will it will improve word of mouth marketing? Will we make money directly from it? Will yes. it improve our uh, customer satisfaction scores or whatever we think the benefit might be? We want to sort of pencil that in as early as possible. Well, that would obviously help you with the ranking component. It makes a lot of sense because if you're going through, you've got an idea to start with. If you're not solving a real problem, that's going to drop down to the bottom or maybe get off the list. Um, if it becomes a big problem with some big benefits, and something yep. big or an advantage for your organization that's a little, what's in it for you that's going to go more to the top of this great um example of what you do to rank so it's pretty um, yeah. pretty cool yeah. for everyone help surface the value of the solution and for yes. the business yes understand that Absolutely. early but you like you said you're making it up as you go but from um, that's what you're doing in a brainstorming session so yep. would this happen generally in brainstorming component or steps or where would this start so you mentioned you're in a brainstorming in a room around ideas. Would you dive straight into this sort of thing 
to rank Absolutely. right there. Totally. Yeah. Okay. So the, the very first thing, once you have, if you mm-hmm. if you if you've got just one idea, yes, um, you still would do this to make sure that that um, people understand what's inside the person's head who had the idea. Yep. If you've got that person with you, you're literally teasing it out of their head. Okay. To say, who are you thinking of? What problem are you solving yes. for them? What benefit are you creating? Mm-hmm. And what's in it for us? Because they probably know, they just haven't said so. No, they. I think people don't look at those questions really at all. Um, I think they say, all right, this, they're obviously working. If they're working with a current product and want to add some features to it, there's obviously an issue they're having to come up with a solution, like you said. Uh, yep. But it's not defined. I just want this. But why? And when you dig in a bit more, you do get to the bottom of what it is. Um, and the why questions are clearly some big questions they'd be asking through the process. Yep. yep. Not very, very good. I mean, you, quite often we'll see, I mean, with, with lots of new cool technology coming out, people say, look, we need an AI solution. <laughs> That's just throwing and everyone goes, Yay, we need an AI solution. Yeah. So you put AI into the middle of that, uh, the idea pad. Yes. Then it says, well, who needs it? Which <laughs> customer actually would benefit from an AI solution? Mm. What problem would, would be potentially solved with an AI solution? Mm-hmm. And before you know it, you don't need an AI solution, yeah. but you might have a problem that's still worth solving. Yeah, get it. But this AI so, is, a, is potentially more of digging into the solution, right? But you might find a problem, like you said, that needs to be solved in a different way. Totally. Okay. So the so once, and we probably give about 10 minutes per idea. So it doesn't have to take a long time. It can okay. often be, you know, five to 10 minutes just to smash that information out. Um, or draw from data you already have. The if you've got more than one idea, well then you need to pick which one to work on first. Okay. I mean, in our in our training course, one of the things we teach is a bit of an icebreaker and a little bit of fun is juggling. Yep. And the and the analogy of juggling two prioritisation is a pretty pretty useful one because mm-hmm. you can juggle one or two balls without too many problems. Yes. With a bit of practice, you can juggle three, mm-hmm. but it becomes an order of magnitude more difficult. To start juggling four or five which is way beyond me i can tell you <laughs> and and the same thing happens with ideas you can handle one maybe two possibly three but as you start to take on more and more everything just falls to the floor and nothing actually happens so it's really important to pick a small subset of ideas as early as possible okay so mm-hmm. you're you're basically your objective of your first phase is capture your ideas, put them into a bucket, rank them, maybe get two or three that you want to keep exploring. So that would be what you'd recommend. Don't explore 100. Yeah, because yeah, it's never going to go anywhere. Like you said, if you're exploring yep. one thing for 10 minutes a day, it's not going to really go anywhere. Yeah. Makes sense. So the, the next thing we'll do is we'll use some, uh, some, again, quick and dirty ranking criteria. Okay. It's not really scientific, mm-hmm. um, but it gives people a sense of comfort that they've had some buy-in in the process. Okay. So we'll, we'll rank by things like how big is the market? Um, mm-hmm. how, uh, how aligned to strategy do we think this particular idea is? Um, what's the impact of the problem to the customer? And we have a fairly simplified sort of ranking scale that isn't intended to say this is absolutely going to be a winner. But of the ideas that we have on in front of us, which one should we work on first? Mm-hmm. And that's the only question it's trying to assist us with. Okay. So then you've got, so we come out of this process, we look at um, the ranking components. We know we're solving a real problem. We're giving some benefits to the business and we're also having some benefits to the customers. Um, we've ranked them. We've got an idea that's at the top. What do we do now? So you're now done with the ideation. Yes. You move into what we call our explore stage. Okay. And so you take those, those that short list of ideas. You don't yes. throw away the other ones because they're all good too. Yep. But you take the um, uh, the the short list of ideas, and now we need to go and actually do do the hard work. Okay. Now, what is um, hard work defined as from your perspective? So the, the what we're now trying to work out is each one of those ideas, these ideas could actually be a disaster. We don't know. Okay. Uh, or it could be a, a, a golden nugget. Again, we don't know. Mm. So the, the things we need to start try and validate is we need to try and find out, do, can we actually find the customer we just described? Okay. And so if you have a good understanding of the, your, your existing target market and the customers you're looking at, that might be a no-brainer. Um, or someone might have to find a different segment that you don't really have your finger on um, just yet. So you need to, to do the work to make sure you can actually find that customer. And ideally, that should be easy. If in the, in the early sort of research phases you simply can't find the customer you just described, then it's probably it's going to be pretty difficult to market to them later on and actually sell the product to them. But if you're pretty much stepping over 
customers left, right and centre, it shouldn't be hard to find them. Um, the next thing to do if you can find them is to have literally have a chat with them to see if in the conversation with that customer, they quite naturally share with you in the context that you dreamed up that they are absolutely driven mad by the problem you imagined in the first place. Um, if the customer says, it sort of doesn't raise a particular problem or doesn't express the problem or, or expresses that they could quite happily live with the existing problem, mm -hmm. then there probably isn't a problem worth solving. And again, you pack up your bags on that one and go and grab another idea. Get it. So what the kind of things you're looking for now are you want to find a, a clear target market that mm -hmm. you can access and you want to have the, the problem is raw and painful to them on a regular basis or if it's not regular, um, it might be at a critical moment in time. Um, I mean, I think, you know, just reflecting on an insurance product at the time we're experiencing bushfires here in, in Australia, mm. um, the people aren't going to be making insurance claims every day, but when they do, boy, that's got to really work easily for them so they can get their life back on track. Yeah, correct. So that critical point in time might be a, a key problem to solve for them so that they're able to get their lives back on track. Okay. So it can be infrequent, but really important, or frequent, but not that important, but enough of a pain point that people want to address it. Makes sense. And it's all dependent on numbers then too. So if you can find a, a herd of customers out there that have the same problem and they express that they're interested, then that idea is clearly worth exploring even further. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So obviously, the, 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 the sweet spot we're looking for is a large group of customers yep. that have a really burning problem that they're willing to exchange something of value for to have solved. Okay, so that's that's the holy grail of what we're looking at when we're trying to idea yep. and create a product, basically. Yeah, that's right. One yeah. customer with a low value problem isn't probably isn't worth working. No, <laughs> stay away. <laughs> if it happened to be the CEO who wasn't going to pay for it anyway, <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> very very good. So yep. we've we've got to the point where let's let's play this out. We've um, we've got a problem now which has a herd of customers that are really have a burning problem and a burning desire to actually pay for a solution. Um, we've actually validated a concept, an idea from a point, um, but that's the idea, right? So is are we uh, at a solution yet or are we still looking at more problem focus here? We are not even close to the solution. Yeah, that's what I gathered um, based on this conversation. Yep. Yeah. So at this point, what the, you've actually okay. got um, the most important part of the story uh, resolved. Yes. If at the, at the earliest stage, you can sort of go to the rest of the business mm -hmm. and say, we have uncovered yes. a, a burning problem that a significant market size mm -hmm. or a significant marketplace has that is currently unsolved by anybody, including our competitors. What you're basically saying is there's gold in these hills. Let's go for it. Okay. So we don't know how we're going to, we don't know how we're going to get there just yet, mm -hmm. but it's worth the journey. And uh, and I've, you find that there is a realisation in the, the broader marketplace that um, starting at problem first is really what people need to do, but not necessarily what everyone does. So um, it's really about investing quite a bit of time into that stage so then you can walk out of it and comfortably design a solution that's going to solve that problem, not just design a solution that you think is going to solve a problem for some customer that may add some value at some point. So validating. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, and, and this is where mm -hmm. the kind of the, the problem validation mm -hmm. early is yep. a huge uh, sort of economic saver. Yes. If you can you can iterate on solutions, mm -hmm. you know, literally it's like you know playing in traffic with your eyes closed. Yep. You can get across the road occasionally without getting smashed, <laughs> but chances are you're going to die in the process. I <laughs> get it. Um, and it's a bit like you know just building solutions without looking at the marketplace. Yes. You build it and not only do you fail fast, you fail catastrophically mm. and expensively. Yeah, it does cost a lot of money when you're building product. If, on the other hand, you are open to the idea that your idea was a dud to begin with, but you don't know yet, mm. um, you test it with the market in the co in, from the perspective of, does it actually solve a problem? Mm -hmm. If it doesn't solve a problem, then you've saved an enormous amount of time, money and effort mm. um, not building a solution to a problem that was never there in the first place. Now, based on that point, um, do you find a bit of pushback still in the marketplace when you have that conversation around solving the right problem and focusing on that, investing quite a bit of time researching and planning and speaking to customers and all that aspect? How do you find the uptake from that perspective? 
Um, it's really tough. Yeah. Um, it's really tough mm. in in the sense that people think their ideas are awesome. Yeah, that's um, probably people get really invested yeah. in their idea. Yeah. So of course it's awesome, and the more senior you are, the more awesome your ideas mm. are. Yeah. <laughs> which is almost always a lie. Yeah. It's a fallacy. Yeah. And I think the the best discipline you can bring to that is to accept that your ideas are likely to be crap most of the time. Okay. To start and, there. <laughs> and, and the starting point. Yeah. Which is not that everyone's ideas are crap. It's just that they're they're made up. Yep. And so as a, as a starting point. So we want to sort of iterate and learn as early as possible. Okay. I think the the organizations we've seen who have started to adopt more of a sort of an open learning and I guess the the scientific method to that early um, learning stage yes. are the ones that actually accelerate faster mm-hmm. once they um, uh, once they kind of get a head of steam behind them, as oh. opposed to organisations that are almost literally polluting their their product catalogue uh-huh. with ideas that, or or solutions that suck. Yeah, and if you have one failed solution, it becomes more difficult to get budget for another solution, right? So, yep. um, and it becomes more challenging to keep innovating. And then sometimes an organisation might say, "This is just too hard. We'll stick to what we know." Um, and that's pretty much shooting itself really in the foot in terms of where they're going yep. and what's happening in the marketplace. The, the, the other benefit you get from understanding the problem first is you get a value proposition straight yeah. out of the gate. Mm. Um, so you don't need to work out what the solution is going to be. You can simply say for a particular target market mm-hmm. who has this problem, mm. if we solve it, we'll deliver this benefit, which are the bones of, yes. of any any value proposition. Um, and you know the uh, Amazon are uh, a rumored. I, I haven't seen the evidence myself, but it have the concept of the um, the the PR release before we actually build the product. And effectively, that's what we're talking about. Have a value proposition before you start building anything, um, so that you can deliver that value proposition when you have the product completed. And there's nothing. And if, I think there's a bit more of that happening um, where you test co- um, concepts. And when you're trying yep. to find a customer, how would you find your customers that you're actually querying? So you mentioned if you can't find your customers, it's a bit challenging. But if you pair it back and people are looking at, all right, maybe we're working with our customers daily, it becomes easy, right? Uh, so you can query them. But if they're in a slightly new marketplace and trying to establish an idea that's slightly outside of their realm, what would a step be to actually find some customers? Would they jump online? Would they start making calls? Where would be an approach that you'd recommend there? The very first thing we do is we yeah. try and capture as much information about the the target market as we can. We capture okay. all of the assumptions that we need. Yep. Um, and again, we will often invoke the MSU protocol to do yeah. that, uh, <laughs> to, to to kick things off. Yep. But very quickly, that market segmentation will be refined when we start looking for and finding customers. So if you were looking for, um, again, just using Uber as an example. Yes. If you wanted to see stressed people trying to get away from the airport, mm-hmm. um, and you you thought that would be a great opportunity for Uber, yes, um, then as soon as you put that context around it, where are you likely to find those people? At the airport. <laughs> Standing in the airport. airport. Yeah, correct. So mm-hmm. as you start to kind of zoom in mm-hmm. your uh, your definition of the customer, the method for finding where those customers are likely to be becomes a lot easier. Get it. Um, and so you know, it could be physically going to a location where they're likely to be. If you're in a retail environment, go to the retail environment. If it's a if it's a community of interest that you don't normally sort of uh, circle in, then find those communities online. Find one person in that community. See if you can be invited in. Go to a meetup at those communities. Mm-hmm. Or you know you start to think of different ways of of sort of solving that particular problem mm-hmm. and finding ways to speak to customers. I think you're sort of touching a bit upon the um, one problem, one customer focus. So if you know your problem you're really solving, um, you know the type of customer that it is. We have generally, uh, people talk about personas and I want to get an understanding if this makes sense in your context of world or are you defining one persona that you're talking to or are you defining multiple potential personas that are solving that problem for? Does that come up in your world? Um, definitely, yeah. but we're very careful about using the term persona okay. at that very early stage. Yep. Um, owners get a bad rap when they're made up. Yep. And so, as I mentioned, if uh-huh. their initial target market is often made up before yes. you start to refine it. Get it. Once the once your target market has been refined and you know the customers exist, 
and you, you know, that, that becomes your focus, mm -hmm. then you can build a persona around that to represent that validated target market. Okay. So you define that after you've gone through the process. That's right. People. That's right. Not start there. So then the, the persona actually represents real people mm -hmm. in, a, in a real target market. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Um, in terms of um, anything else you'd like to add in terms of validation. So now we've got an idea that we've validated, that we're really clear that we've got big market, uh, a lot of customers, we're solving, adding a lot of value and benefit, and then we've got a, an actual monetary benefit for the business. Yep. Um, where we've got an idea that we're actually going to explore. So we've validated this idea to a point where we've got a business case or some sort of business case around it. What generally would be next steps that a business would take from there? So we, we use that, that, that business case yep. essentially to validate the remaining thinking around it. So there's okay. a number of other things you'd look at, like yep. uh, who are the competitors? Mm -hmm. um, what does the revenue model look like? Mm -hmm. um, do we think we can actually make money from it? Does yes. it align to our strategy? Um, and effectively, that, that business case thinking gives you the permission to go and spend money on the, uh, on the design phase. And so it's in the, in the de uh, design phase that you then start exploring new solution concepts. Okay, so this sticks pretty much as a definition if we go back to your double diamond approach, right? So you've started out all these ideas, you framed them into one that you're happy with. Yep. Um, now you're gonna go throw that idea in and for 10 ways maybe you might solve this and then explore that I'm imagining. So yeah, I'll, that sort of gives a bit of context a little bit more, hopefully explains a little bit more for the listeners. Yep, that's right. Yep. Oh, perfect. And so then the, the second kind of validation mm -hmm. is once you've uh, kind of sort of looked at a journey map or sort of that customer context in more detail, which we do in, our, in as the first part of our um, design phase, mm -hmm. we then sort of blow the doors off and say, okay, now how could we solve it? And one solution might be the AI solution we had initially to yes. start off with. But we deliberately try and think, okay, let's put that one, our initial solution to one side. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can come up with two to three other completely different solutions mm. to push our imaginations a little bit further. Get it. And the, re and the reason for that is it just breaks the stranglehold on often the, 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 the blinkered approach to that first idea mm -hmm. um, that keeps us on rails that we can't get off. So once we say that, that first idea was awesome, love it to bits, but we're not going to focus on that right now. We're going to come back to it potentially. Let's think of some other ideas. And the result of that is often that people come up with really interesting alternatives where the amalgamation of three different ideas actually makes up the best idea. Yeah, get it. So you're basically pulling, all right, we've got a key problem. It's once you know what a definition of problem is, there are always many ways to solve a problem, right? So yeah. um, if you want to tie your shoes, there's a few ways you can do that, for example. Um, so you've got different ways to solve a problem. One could be throwing people at it, for example. That's just a different way you can do it. Um, so now we've got multiple solutions. Then how do we go about validating these? Do we go back to our customers? What do we do? Right, so now you're in, now you're in solution validation. Yeah. So the first part was problem validation. Mm -hmm. The second part is solution validation. Yes. So we go back to the same type of customers mm -hmm. and you can show them a, a prototype or yep. a, a sample or even a, a marketing pitch okay. depending on what you're trying to validate. Mm -hmm. And say and sort of say, dear customer, I want you to now show me mm. how you would use this thing or what you would do next if you had this thing in front of you yes. um, to try and solve your, this particular problem. Get it. And so this is where prototyping um, product or sort of the, uh, and this is where we would refer to the minimum viable product, the MVP, as an experiment before you launch something um, to try and work out which of the solution pathways we're looking at are the like, most likely to be successful. Okay, so um, your MVP is really about really testing your initial um, problem that you're solving and the first solution, the best solution that you think you've picked is the right one with the customer base. That's right. And yep. to deliver enough value yes. as early as possible mm. to validate everything. Yep. So you're using right. MVP rather than, are you using MVP as a product that can go to market or more of a testing? We, we tread carefully with the term MVP because it's been used and abused in different, different ways. Correct. We, we specifically refer to the MVP as being um, a pre-launch experiment. Okay, so we'll look something around a prototype type component, I would imagine. That's right. Yep, get it. 
So the the um, the minimum collection of features or functionality to test a business market or a technology problem. Okay. What we find is an MVP, or from that world, that's not really an MVP because it, it may not even be a product yet. It might just be more of a clickable prototype that people can yep. look at, see, touch, feel, and get a gauge on what the outcomes might be if they had this in their hands. So I think that's what it's sort of leaning at, right? 100%. Yeah, get it. But the chances are if you launch that thing, it would mm-hmm. bomb because yeah. it's not ready. It's right. It's not marketable. Yeah. And, that, and that's yeah. actually where we see the concept of the minimum viable product is often yeah. termed, sorry, often used as the minimum thing we can push out the door so we can tick off our project. Yeah, okay. Just not the intention <laughs> of the minimum viable product. No, not at all. Um, that is something that's in the hands of the consumer adding some value and some benefits. So it's probably yep. beyond what you're talking about from the first thing you show that's a customer. Right. Yeah, get it. So once, so once you come out of that, that validation, once you have the confidence mm. to say, look, I think this is the the right solution concept, mm-hmm. we have the right general design yes. in our heads, then you can, you know, if in a more formalized environment, you might start to write technical specifications or um, design documents in a less formal or a more agile environment where you're sort of filling in the blanks as you go along, you would spin up an agile project which would start to build and learn and test in smaller increments. Um, either way, that's when you're you're in the position to say, okay, let's let's go. Yeah, you're starting to implement something now, an actual the actual solution that the customers have told you is the right way to go. That's that's right. Yep. But the, the key thing is, at each stage, you're kind mm-hmm. you you think of almost two two metrics. One is yep. risk, and the other is confidence. Okay. At the at the ide, the ideation stage, you have a big bag of risk and no confidence. Mm. Okay. You might think you're confident, <laughs> but there's really no organizational confidence in any particular idea. Yes. As you move through this process, you're trying to extract the risk from it okay. and increase the confidence. Mm-hmm. And this is, I think this is an important point to, to one you were making earlier around, do, do we get resistance to this? And the answer is yes. And there may be some situations where if the risk of failure is low, mm. all of the effort required to go and speak with customers and sort of stuff around um, delaying the process yes. may simply not be worth it. Okay, so it might, might be something at the front end that you'd want to be looking at, um, establishing yep. what is the risk behind us actually implementing a solution to yep. this problem that we think is a great idea. If it's a weak yep. turnaround, it's probably not worth investing and then let's just yep. test it and see what happens. I mean, a, probably a, a trivial but probably yeah. maybe a little fun example. Yeah. I've got an 11-year-old son who is making breakfast for himself this morning. Yeah. Um, he wanted to make himself toast. Yep. So we considered two experiments. He wanted to put uh, chili sauce on toast. Nice job. <laughs> That's a pretty lightweight experiment, and the yep. cost of failure is low. Yeah, a couple if of toasts going to be. I want to put a nice toaster. Yeah. Then I might have said, no, that's not an experiment you really want to try out. <laughs> so the kind of the, the cost and the risk of the experiment needs to be weighed off against the the potential impacts. Okay. So if the cost of delay for mm-hmm. the customer research is going to far exceed the cost of just making the thing and getting it to market, Yes. then you might just want to put it into market. Yep, okay. If, on the other hand, uh, the cost of getting it wrong could enormously impact the business, mm-hmm. then you definitely want to invest in risk mitigation and in increasing that confidence. And that's all we're really doing here. The bit, Like you said, the bigger, more investment into a solution, that means it's more risky, right? So if you're not testing, engaging that and seeing if it's the right thing to do, then that's... That can be the detriment of the actual project and even a business in some cases. Or in, yep. like I said, we're talking to startups and founders as well. Um, they may solve the wrong problem and invest people's money, their own money, into something that's never going anywhere. Um, so that is a big challenge that people need to look at. What is the risk? And then I think, like you said, if there's a massive risk there for you or for your business, um, you want to be digging in and actually querying the customer first, making sure you're solving the right problems so you're not... So you're reducing your risk. There's no guarantees, right? So in the end, we can build a product and still the customers may have said, yeah, this would be great. This is the benefits. But maybe there's not as much uptake as you expected. Mm-hmm. But at least um, you've gone down that journey and you haven't got no customers at all and you've added um, some value to some people. So there's always risk in any product development. Totally agree. Yeah. And the kind of the, I guess the last part of the validation or the, um, is... You kind of aside from testing versus validation so yeah. the the testing would be when we're going through the implementation phase did we actually build the product the way we said we're going to build the product yes 
Um, does it technically do what we said it was going to do? Mm -hmm. Does it solve the problem we said it was going to solve? Which is essentially product testing as opposed to marketplace validation. Get it. The final validation is just after you've launched. So, okay, we've launched it. People are actually using it. Um, does it in fact do what we said it was going to do? Is it solving the customer problem? Mm. So as the, the product kind of continues into, uh, from launch into its product life cycle, we'll continue to, to test and validate whether our original assumptions still stand up. Yeah, because um, in, in the end, you've, you've, you put this solution in the hands of the customer now, so they have it. Um, but not, not necessarily means it's solving the problem in the right way still because the customer generally doesn't know what they don't know um, until they get something. So we find that once you've got a product in the hands of somebody, then um, you start getting additional feedback as to, oh, this could add some more value. And then you're doing the same process again, really, because then you get yep. new ideas into the whole bucket and then you're starting that process again from what I'm imagining. That's right. Yep. And as new competitors come in, the mm -hmm. value of the, the yep. features or functions you put in initially mm -hmm. will start to decrease in value yes. because those damn competitors start copying, copying. what you are doing or, or solving the same and similar problems. Mm. So it becomes an ongoing arms race yes. through the product life cycle to yep. come up with an even more valuable problem to solve mm -hmm. or to solve it you know, better, faster, cheaper yep. um, for, for those same customers. That's some really good insights there, um, Nick. So... I feel it's had some value to some of our listeners in terms of what it might look like to actually validate from a full idea, right, or from ideas to uh, then starting, all right, you might have an idea for a solution, but let's pair it back right back to a problem. Um, and what is the real problem we're trying to solve? And does that problem add value? Once we know that, we've validated that, we jump into what is the solution, validate those, and then we go through to delivery, I think. Um, and at that point, you might find, and what we've found is, um, generally, when you're validating, you might validate solutions and you might find that that generally might fall off and then that idea gets scrapped because it doesn't actually work anymore. Um, so there are different ways. So when you're, and like you said, you might pick the best solution that you perceive to be best for the customer, but that might mm -hmm. not be the right one. So then it might be the second or third one or it might be something completely different. So it's always iterative in testing and actually understanding what the best solution is or the best yep. problem you're trying to solve, right? As long as everyone keeps an open mind and assesses everything continually, yes. then that sets you on the right path. Yeah, uh, like you said, I think at one of the start of the conversation is we get stuck on our ideas and we think they're the best ideas and everyone's going to take them and buy them and it's going to add so much value. But do we really dig in and look at that? Um, some Most people don't. Most companies don't. Um, and a lot that we've worked with have basically thrown ideas at us and that's why we started this journey and even founders we mm. find to take a bit about a bit of background um this podcast uh, or there's two of them really so this podcast started um because we started seeing a lot of founders and businesses just wasting and burning money on solutions that really didn't make sense to begin with um and they've either been technically challenged behind them and haven't delivered from a delivery perspective they've failed or they've failed from this is the wrong solution and the customer doesn't actually need it. Um, so how do we solve both those problems? So they're, they're key things that we're exploring and talking to people like yourself right. and how we can add more value to the marketplace um, and help people um, on the right journey that want to do the right things and test things and deliver better outcomes for their customers um, actually get to that outcome. Because in the end, it's really about the customer um, and are we solving something for that customer? And obviously we need some benefit for doing that. Um, and if we can't derive that, then, then that's probably not a problem to solve. That sounds very good. Anything else you'd like to add at this stage, Nick? I think it's, it's probably appropriate yeah. to throw in a little bit of a pitch for um, yeah. you know, what we do yeah. in terms of training product managers. So if anyone wants to kind of dive into this in more detail, yes. um, we run uh, a training course, a three-day training course yeah. that steps through that entire product delivery process in a lot more detail. Uh -huh. And you learn to juggle. Um, and if any organizations are wanting to learn more about uh, about what we do and how to do it, um, they can come along to brainmates.com.au and learn from us. Perfect, Nick. No, cool. thanks, for, uh, thanks for joining us today. Really got some good insights for people that are listening um, around where do you actually start when you have an idea because I think um, a lot of people hit the go button, they have an idea, bang, let's go, and I think let's pair it back, slow down, put the brakes on and actually test that and validate it. So it's really big, good insights from yourself and yep. um, your team at Brain Mates. I really appreciate it. Fantastic. Thanks very much, guys.